gathered here because we have chosen Christ, but because Jesus, in his abundant love, has chosen us. He has yes. called us to be his Oh God, you have searched us and known us. You read our every thought from afar. There is not a word on our tongue or on our heart that you do not know. The joy of those who hear the call of Jesus be with you all. And also with you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome once again to Lake Benton United Methodist Church. Good morning to all of our friends joining us online this morning on Facebook and YouTube. God is with you at home just as surely as God is here with us in this place. I am Pastor Vincent Slocum. I am so pleased to be here with all of you this morning. This morning we are beginning a new sermon series, Becoming the People of God, a sermon series all about what it means to answer the call from God that, that God places on each and every one of our lives, no matter who we are, no matter where we are, and no matter what we're doing, what that call looks like, and, and how we can respond to it. How can we become the people of God in the most full and true sense of the word? We're beginning that sermon series today. It is also the first Sunday of the month. We have communion today, and we're going to go ahead and get started. Before we begin, however, I invite you all to pause for a moment. Take Take a moment to invite God into your heart this morning. Close your eyes. Take a deep breath. Breathe in the living presence of God, which we share together here in this space, and breathe out whatever worries and cares have been heavy on your heart. Breathe in the living, healing, and strengthening comfort of God's Holy Spirit and Breathe out all anxiety, fear, and doubt. My friends, for the next hour as we share together in this time of worship, I invite you to continue to breathe deeply of God's Holy Spirit. Continue to be present with God and, and present with all of us here in this space as we share together in in this time of worship. And when you are ready, I invite you all to stand this morning, this morning, and we will begin our worship service in song. <laughs>
sideways or down. Okay. That's, at least you're not all the way down. That's, that's all right. Sometimes we have those days. How are the guys doing over here? Okay. I got some sideways. I got some thumbs up. Presley, what's up? How are you doing today? All right. Good deal. There's, there comes Lily. Good morning, Lily. Good morning. All right. Awesome. So this week, you guys are doing something a little bit differently. A little bit different than, than the grown-ups are doing. Y'all are going to be talking about something totally different than what we're going to be talking about with them. I don't think they're ready for what you guys are, are going to be doing today. Like, they need a little bit more work. They've been stuck with me the past few weeks, and so we need to play catch-up uh, a little bit. Uh, so you guys are going to be talking about baptism. Today. Who knows what baptism is? Show of hands. Okay, so we got we got some hands up. We got some hands up. Okay, so so some of the folks that have their hands up, who wants to what is baptism? What is baptism? Presley. Yeah. So it's you get your head in water. Sometimes they dunk your head. In, in water. Um, some churches will even, they've got like big pools and they'll, they'll dunk your whole, their whole body into the water. We, we don't do that here. We've just got a little, little uh, basin over here, like a little bowl, uh, just a fancier word for a bowl. And, and we just pour a little bit of water on, on your head. But yeah, so you get water and, and you accept Jesus. You take Jesus in, into your life. Turner, what? You had your hand up, too. What were you going to say? Kind of what she said. Okay. So Presley did a good job. I think she did a good job, too. I think she did a real good job. So there's a story in the Bible where they talk about it. It's, it's a story that, that I like an awful lot. Uh, it's a story of when Jesus was baptized. And, and when Jesus was baptized, Jesus was one of those that they dipped his whole body into it. He didn't have a little bowl like we have. He went right out into a river and, and was baptized there by a guy named John. John the baptizer who baptized a whole bunch of, of other people. We've, we've talked about John the baptizer or John the Baptist before. 
So Jesus went out to a river, and, and he, was, he was dunked into the water by, by John. And when Jesus stood up, all of a sudden the clouds parted, and a dove flew through the sky. It was like this magical movie kind of moment, and suddenly everyone heard this big booming voice from the sky that said, This is my son, and with him I am very pleased was what the voice said, and, and that was how Jesus was, was baptized. And I really like that story because it kind of tells us something really important about baptism. So like Presley said, when we're baptized, we accept Jesus into our lives. And another way of, of thinking about that is, is when we're baptized, we enter into God's family. We become a member of God's family. We take God's love, right? God loves everybody, right? We think that you guys all, all good with that? You say God loves everybody? Okay, good. Good. Yeah, you're, you're good people. I knew you'd be on board with that. James, come on down. <laughs> all right, so we know that God loves everybody everybody and that God loves everybody no matter what no matter who they are no matter where they come from no matter what they've done God loves everybody when we're baptized we take that love and we make it a part of our hearts forever and we agree to carry that love and keep that love for ourselves so that so that we always have it but but so we can also share it with other people what do you guys think that sound okay to you guys? Did you okay this morning? Okay. Are we ready to head back? Miss Karen and, and Miss Judy got all kinds of fun stuff for you guys to do today. Are we all set? You guys are experts on baptism now, right? When we have our next baptism here in the church, you guys want to come up and do it for me? No. I'll just sit in the pews. You guys can. <laughs> all right, good deal. Let's, let's go ahead and pray, and we'll send you right back to the lake room. All right. Thank you, God, Thank you, God, for giving us your love. For giving us your love. Always, Always. Everywhere. Everywhere. No matter what. No matter what. And thank you for making us beloved members of your family. Thank you for making us beloved members of your family. Help us to remember, Help us to remember that we are important to you. That we are important to you. We are important to our church. We are important to our families. And we are very, very loved. Amen. All right. Head on back, guys. Head on back. All right. All right. Wow, it feels a lot heftier in me. <laughs> <laughs> All right, at this time, I would like to invite Diane and Barb to, to come up, if, if they would be so kind, and, and help us out with our tithes and offerings this morning.
almighty and everlasting God. It brings us great joy to place these gifts at your altar. May they be for us a source of your abundance as we seek to be builders of your family and sharers of your love right here in our community. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And My friends, please greet one another with a sign of God's peace this morning. How are you? Bye, uh, Come on. All right.
this morning, anything for which we as a congregation <coughs> be in prayer together. Um, I'd just like to ask uh, to be in prayer uh, for myself as I continue to go through my physical therapy that, you know, if it's God's will that I would have that surgery. Yeah. So. All right. Continued prayers for, for Curtis undergoing physical therapy and, and prayers for his family as, as they try to be there for him. safe travels with all the bad weather coming our way that everyone arrives where they need to arrive and makes their way back safe and sound. And our new granddaughter is a month old and her due date is actually tomorrow. Doing good. Okay. Prayers for new grandbabies that come earlier than expected. On our healthy nonetheless and doing well. The other joys my grandbaby was born January 1st, New Year's Aww. Day. Yay! Yay. 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 my dad's birthday. Two so grandbabies. <laughs> and, and, we have, and we have roses on the altar for, for those, those two grandbabies oh, this, this morning. It is not for the most part. No, I, I suppose in your own mind you can make it for that. But, but no. I'm asking for prayers for um, the family of my friend Julie who lost her battle of cancer this week. Okay. Prayers for, for the life and the, and the soul of, of Judy that she be received into God's care. Prayers for her family as they grieve her loss. A uh, couple of joys. Um, my brother-in-law had hip replacement is doing very, very well. And on Thursday morning early, our we're going to call him our great grandson was born. Um, his dad was like an extra grandson for us, and um, it was kind of a difficult time. They lost the first one, so we're very, very happy and pleased and full for them that this one was born and he's perfectly healthy and beautiful. Excellent. More prayers for, for grandbabies, the grandbabies that are biologically born in, into our families and, and the grandbabies and, and babies that, that are adopted into our family, whether by law or, or just in our hearts. Well, my friends, whatever joys and concerns you, you have on your hearts this morning, whether they're joys and concerns that you shared with us or the joys and concerns that you've kept to yourselves, in just a moment we will share a, a moment of silence together, at which point I invite you to offer whatever prayers you choose and whatever words you choose. And, in your own hearts as we prepare to come together as a congregation to share in the time of prayer. Almighty God, God, our strength, our comfort, our rock, and our redemption. Lord, this morning we, we come before you in prayer, remembering the sick and, and the hurting and, and the struggling in our lives. We remember especially Judy, who has recently passed. Lord, we give you thanks that she has been received into your care, Lord, and 
We ask that you be with her family as, as they grieve her loss, as they attempt to mend the hole in their lives that emerges from her passing. Lord, we remember also Curtis. Be with him, strengthen him in his physical therapy. We ask that your healing be upon him. That your will be done in, in all things, but if it should be your will to, to keep him from surgery, Lord. Be with his family. Lord, this morning we give you thanks also for the babies, the grandbabies, and also for the mothers, the fathers, the grandmothers, and the grandfathers, the great-grandmothers and great-grandfathers, all those loving smiling, caring lives which you have blessed us to share here together in, in this world. For the strength, the, the comfort, the joy, and the hope they bring to us. Lord, by our baptism, you have made us one in you, one people one family. In our own families, we honor that. We make it a part of our homes, our lives. And for that, Lord, we, we give you thanks. Lord, for all these things, for those prayers which we have named here before you and, and those which we have not had the strength that you who know all have seen in our hearts. Lord, we pray to you now this morning in the words that your Son and our Savior Jesus Christ taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right. At this time, I'd like to invite Linda Zeeb to come up and share our scripture reading this morning from the Gospel of Matthew. For, for those of you following along in your pew Bibles, or or in your Bibles at home, our reading this morning is Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. Again, that's Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13. A reading from the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax collection station, and he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. The word of God for the people of God. Praise be God.
was November 1994. I was in fifth grade. I was not a good student. But I did know how to make myself belch. <laughs> Often and on command. I got a lot of mileage out of that one. And my teachers loved it. For the past couple of years, I had been in and out of the office at my school. I was a regular fixture in the school principal's office. At conferences, my fourth grade teacher, Mr. Morris, told my parents point blank that I was never going to amount to anything if I didn't get my act together. Fifth grade was not going any better. And then my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Garner, tried a different approach. He started giving me a little more freedom in the classroom, giving me more choice on what I would study. He put me on an accelerated track in math and, and English, and I thrived. Fifth grade ended up being a pretty good year. And then it ended. Flash forward. It was February. 1998, I was in eighth grade. I was not a good student. But I was good at fighting and at throwing trash cans down the middle school steps, both of which I did often and on command. And the hall monitors and custodians loved it. After a pretty good year in fifth grade, I spent the next couple years struggling to adjust to my new social setting in middle school. I did not adjust well. I vandalized classrooms, swore at bus drivers, killed teachers' pets. I mean, they were fish, but a pet's a pet. And it turns out they don't respond well to putting them under heat lamps or pouring a half gallon of glue into their tanks, which, yeah, means that this happened two different times. At this point, most of the folks in my school had pretty much given up seemed pretty clear that I was a lost cause, and the best you could hope for was a whole lot of destruction and insult for the effort. But my English teacher, Mr. Fisher, took a chance, tried a different approach. In the back of his class, Mr. Fisher had an entire room, like a big walk-in closet, packed to the gills with books. Mr. Fisher gave me free access to his book room. I could take a book out of it any time I wanted, which was not something that he did for every student. Treasure Island, Animal Farm, iRobot, Tarzan. I discovered some of my very favorite books in Mr. Fisher's class, and, and in English class, at least. English, Eighth grade was a pretty good year. Flash forward. It was May 2001. I was in 12th grade. I was not a good student. But I was really good at skipping and failing classes, <coughs> both of which I did often and on command. My parents loved it. Over the past couple of years, I had been suspended for theft, vandalism, smoking on school grounds, and more. Despite a decent year in eighth grade English class, in ninth grade, I became so thoroughly unmanageable that I was very nearly expelled from my school altogether. 
It was during this time, also, if you can believe it, that I began to feel my first initial stirrings of what I later discovered was a call to ministry. It should probably come as no surprise that most folks questioned the sincerity of that call. I was young. I was emotionally vulnerable. I was very confused. I hadn't really seemed capable of mustering anything more than a few short bursts of creative and, and hopeful potential before I almost immediately imploded and did everything I could to take everyone else down with me. Which is why it was May 2001, and I had just failed high school. I needed 24 credits to graduate, and I had just barely managed to get 17, five of which were choir. <laughs> And if I'm being really honest with myself and with all of you, that could have been the end of my story. As unrepentantly willful and destructive as I had been over the years, I think some probably would have argued that that should have been the end of my story. I had been given every possible opportunity in life, good parents, a safe home, a family that loved me, compassion, patience, food, safety, security, and education. Again and again, I had teachers go above and beyond to make sure that I had a chance to thrive. And again and again, I had thrown it back in their faces and squandered the opportunity. I had made my own bed. Perhaps it was time for me to lie in it. I like Matthew, the disciple, not, not the gospel. I, mean, I like the gospel, too. But, but right now, I'm, I'm talking about the disciple, the one who wrote the gospel, the one that we hear about in this morning's reading. We don't know an awful lot about Matthew before he became a disciple of Jesus. Like most of the Gospels, or like most of the disciples, the Gospels don't really give us much background information on Matthew other than to tell us he was a tax collector, which actually does tell us quite a bit. I mean, the job of tax man is as old as the very first human cities. And the tax man has never been popular in any age of human history, but the tax man was really unpopular in the Roman world. And especially in the Roman world of Judea and Galilee, the very world in which Jesus and his disciples lived. You see, the Romans didn't do taxes the same way that most societies do today, where governments collect taxes from folks directly, where everyone pays a set tax rate, and, and anyone who doesn't pay their taxes, at least in theory, ends up having to pay a penalty or, or gets brought up on charges. Instead, the Romans contracted with individuals, <coughs> companies, and guilds, to collect taxes for them. And it worked like this. The Roman emperors would set a fixed tax rate to be levied, and they would pass that along to these private companies and, and guilds. And these companies and guilds would go out and collect that tax from folks on behalf of the Roman emperors. But here was the rub. The emperor did not pay these companies and guilds to collect those taxes. Instead, it was the guilds or the company's responsibility to collect even more money from folks over and above that tax rate than anything extra those companies and guilds got to keep. 
That was how they made their money. It was a system that incentivized these companies and guilds, a system that incentivized tax collectors to squeeze every last penny they could out of folks, whether those folks could afford it or not. For the most part, tax collectors in the Roman world were little more than thugs or loan sharks, which meant that these guilds and companies were little more than gangs or cartels. For foreigners in conquered territories like Judea and Galilee, for folks like Jesus and Mary, John and Simon Peter, for folks without the legal protection of Roman citizenship, tax collection was like opening day of hunting season. And they were little better than animals. For folks in places like Judea and Galilee, tax collectors weren't just unpopular. They were the enemy. They were the ones who had destroyed your shop, stolen your goods, the ones who beat your daughter, who broke your father's hand just to get a few more shekels to jingle in their pouch. But for someone like Matthew, being a tax collector was, was something even worse. Matthew wasn't just some Roman, just another one of the conquerors. Matthew was a Jew. Matthew had been a member of the community. He was a brother. He was a neighbor. He was the kid who grew up playing in the streets. And here he was fleecing his own people, his own community, and throwing in his loyalties with Rome. I imagine that Matthew was someone who had been given every possible opportunity. Good parents, a community that, that loved him, a faith that could have sustained him, food, compassion, security, patience. The gospel doesn't tell us one way or another, <coughs> but I imagine that again and again, friends and family and neighbors went above and beyond to make sure that Matthew didn't fall through the cracks, to make sure that he didn't fall away <coughs> from the community. And again and again, he had thrown it back in their faces. I imagine that Matthew was young, that he was emotionally vulnerable and very confused. And I recognized him. This is the man that Jesus called to that afternoon. This was the man to whom Jesus said, <coughs> It took a while before I found my place in the world. I got older, a little wiser, a whole lot more comfortable my own skin, living behind my own two eyes. And when I did, I found my way to Mott. And first it was to Mott Adult High School, <coughs> where I finally got my diploma. And then it was to Mott Community College, the only college on the map that would accept someone with my record as a student. <laughs> The only college in the region that offered the classes in basic math and arithmetic that I needed just to be ready for a college education. In the years since then, I've studied statistics, advanced calculus, trigonometry, linear equations, quantitative methodologies. I spent two years working as a private consultant in data analytics and strategic impact. 
And I got my start as a grown man taking classes in basic arithmetic <laughs> at a community college. If I have achieved anything <laughs> worth doing, if I have found anything of value and of substance in my life, it's because in those moments in my life, when I have hit rock bottom, and there were a lot of them, <laughs> there was some place that I could go. Whether it was Mr. Fisher's room of books, or a rundown adult ed classroom on the south side of Flint. At every step along the way, there was someone who was willing to see the best in me when all I seemed capable of showing them was my worst. Someone who was willing to take <coughs> one more chance on the kid who had been given every opportunity in the world and who had squandered every last one of them. I talk about <coughs> the importance of accepting people who have been rejected talk a lot about the importance of forgiveness, about the importance of second and third and fourth and fifth chances, about the importance of having patience and grace with people, especially when those folks were really, really hard to have grace and patience with. And I talk about it a lot because I was that kid. I've heard it said that the life of faith is like tilling a field that you rarely ever get to see harvested. It's like planting a seed for a fruit that some other saint will get to pick. Most of the folks who have helped me over the years, most of the folks who planted those small seeds in my life will never get to see just how far I've come from that emotionally vulnerable and very confused kid. Most of them had front row seats for the next time in my life when I imploded and threw all of that away. The sad irony is that those people saved my life. I'm here today because of them and most of them will never know that. I imagine that Matthew's was, was that kind of story. I imagine that, that that is what it must have felt like when some guy from Nazareth called Jesus looked at him, thought that he was worth just one more chance, and said, follow me. Just like that, the guy who had squandered every opportunity in the world was a disciple, one who would be a leader and a trusted friend, who would write the very gospel itself, sometimes seventh or eighth or ninth chances really pay off big. Please pray with me this morning. <clears throat> Almighty God, Lord, this morning we remember all those in our lives who have been there for us, who have seen the best in us when we were at our worst. For those who have helped us to see the better angels of our own nature and brought us to a better way of life. For this morning we ask that you give us hearts which know the grace and patience to offer second and third and fourth and fifth chances. Hearts that know the kind of insane and difficult to believe hope that even after 12 chances, there is still hope and that 
lives truly can be redeemed. Help us to have that kind of courageous and irrational hope. Help us to share your love as freely and as openly <clears throat> as if someone's twelfth chance were just as important as their first. Amen.
When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. May it be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be the body of Christ for the world, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. All right, and now I'd like to invite Pat Mance to come down and help us communion here. Command, you want to let the kids know that they do that? Okay. Once again, that we in the United Methodist Church believe that this table belongs to Jesus Christ. As such, it is open to absolutely everyone, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter where you come from, no matter whether or not this is your first, your second, or your 58th chance. You are always welcome at this table. Table. Anyone who wishes to enjoy a closer walk with Jesus is welcome to join us at this table. As you do, once again, please come forward. You will come to Pat first, who, who has sanitized her hands. Yes? All right, perfect. So, so Pat now has very clean, germ-free hands, and she will use those very clean and germ-free hands to place a piece of bread into your hands, which will be held out, at, at which point you will come over to me and take your bread and dip, not dunk, dip into the, into the chalice here and, and then make your way to your seats. My friends, the table is set. Christ Jesus offers his invitation. Please come forward as we're able.
uh, again. So, so please plan to join us. We'll be meeting in my office after, after service today. Uh, and then next Sunday, we will be restarting our Bible study. So we're starting off with the Gospels next Sunday after church at 11 o'clock. So, so plan to join us. should be lots and lots of fun. Uh, also want to let folks know that coming up on February 17th at noon, I think that's a Saturday, but I'm not positive on, on that. Yeah, so Saturday, February 17th at noon, we will be tying blankets, something we do every year, tying blankets for shelter animals. So uh, on the back of your bulletin, you'll see all the information that you need. Uh, it's always lots and lots of fun. Last year, we folded and tied up 93 blankets that, that went to Adopt-A-Pet Fenton and, and a variety of other shelters in the area. We're aiming for 100 this year. I think we can, I think we can do that. Uh, so check out the announcement in your bulletin for more information. If you have questions about that, uh, you can talk with Barb Harris. So she's the one who organized that, organizes that every year. So, so check with, with Barb Harris if you have any questions or, or uh, concerns about that. Uh, any other announcements? Anything for United Methodist Women? The rummage sale? Yep. Just a reminder that donations will be taking on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Starting the January 22nd, and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they will be the same. Okay, perfect. So, yeah, you got it. You said it all. I was going to reiterate it, but I forgot half of it anyway. So, <laughs> good. All right, my friends, if there are no other announcements, I invite you all to receive this word of blessing as we close out our worship service. May you always offer second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth, eleventh, twelfth chances and may you live to see at least some of those be harvested. May the blessings of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. My friends, you are deeply loved. I invite you to go